It's good to be in God's house this morning. And uh, as we all know, uh, the end of this uh, week, we're going to be celebrating. We're going to be celebrating Independence Day. Now, now, let me. We got the kids up with us today, so I'm going to. I'm going to be like a teacher. How many of you guys like history? You like history? Okay. Now, how many? How many of you guys like history? All right. I'm not talking about the History Channel. I'm talking about. All right. You know. Now, let me ask, ask this question. You can raise your hand up. How many people know what year, or what, what are we celebrating on the, on, the, on, the, on the 4th of July? What are we celebrating? Independence Day. But what did they do on the 4th of July? They signed the Declaration of Independence. Do you guys know that? They signed the Declaration of Independence. Okay. Now, when they did that, they were, uh, they were, at that time, they were part of the British Empire. And uh, what was happening was, and some of you know history, I'm not going to make this a history lesson, but what was happening was they, they had been here for about 150 years or so, the, the settlers, and uh, Great Britain was like, was like doing this to them, was strangling them financially. They were, they were taxing them. You know, today there's a movement called the Tea Party, okay, and they named it after what the Boston, not, how many people know who they named it after? You guys know? The Boston, Boston Tea Party, right? Okay, Boston Tea Party. That's when they jumped on the ship, they dressed like Indians, and they, because they, did, they got tired of paying taxes, you know. And, uh, and that started the Revolutionary War. Now, here's the thing. 238 years ago, 238 years ago is when they, when, they, uh, when they signed the Declaration of Independence. Those people that signed that paper pretty much signed a death warrant for themselves with the, with the nation of England because England saw that as treason. But they had to do something because they were getting strangled. They were getting, you know. So they signed the Declaration of Independence and they fought the Revolutionary War. And uh, they won by the grace of God. You know, it was only, I mean, the British Army was the greatest, the most powerful army on the face of the earth at that time. And these rabble-rousing uh, Americans, they, you know, they were just uh, really, it was a miracle. And I believe it's a miracle that God had ordained. <clears throat> but I wonder if the founding fathers of our nation, who you know, started that whole thing. I wonder what they would think if they could come back today and see what, what has happened. Now, they, there, are, there are people that teach and there are people that, that will try to make you believe that all the, all the, the, the founding fathers were all like born-again Christians, okay? We've talked about this before. They weren't all born-again Christians. They were... There were Anglicans, there were Catholics, there were Unitarians, which means they didn't believe in the Trinity. There, there were Deists, which means they believed in God. But, but one thing they had in common, they, they might not have all had the same theology, but they all believed there was a supreme being that had ordained our lives. They all believed that there was a, a God who, who decided what's right and what's wrong. And they all acknowledged the fact that to have a free nation a nation where we have liberty, without a respect, without a belief in some kind of supreme, supreme being that had our welfare at his heart, without that it would be impossible to govern a free nation. Be impossible. So what has happened over the last several years, decades, centuries, this nation that was founded is one nation under God. We've decided that we don't need the God part anymore. Even though it's still on our money, and even though it's still, it's essentially the leadership of our nation has said, and not just the current president, but this goes back, you know, years. They've, you know, the God thing was, he was there when we needed him. 
You know, we all know, we all see the picture of George Washington kneeling and praying, and we know that he prayed for, for uh, God to, to bless this nation and so forth. You know where he did that? When they, when they first, after the Revolutionary War, and they started our government, after they, they, they signed our Constitution, which is the formation of our government, I think a lot of you know this. Some of you might have read the books about the Harbinger and so forth. But when the first capital of the United States was not Washington, D.C., and it was not Philadelphia, it was New York City. And at the federal building in New York City is where George Washington prayed. And then they went to a church. There was a church there, uh, an Anglican church. I believe it's called St. Paul's. And it's still there. And you know where it is? Right on ground zero. Where all those buildings came down at 9-11 when they wrecked the planes into the buildings, they crashed. That whole place was devastated except for that one corner where that church was. The church is still there. That's where George Washington invoked the hand of our, of our creator to keep our nation. You see, I, I, I fully believe that the, the foundation of the United States of America was a God-given thing. Just as, as, as in the Old Testament, God had a nation called Babylon, the city of Babylon. He used Babylon to protect his people when he delivered his people into captivity. After He let Babylon keep them for 70 years, and then they were allowed to come back and rebuild the city. I believe God prepared this nation, with even with all the things that this nation has been guilty of, and believe me, the United States history has not been pristine. From the very first settlers that came to this continent, they took advantage of the Indians and they had slaves. And that's, that's been kind of like a, a drumbeat throughout our history. And I, I believe, you know, God can't bless that. I've said this last week that the curses that we're dealing with today, you know, the same-sex marriage and the abortion and all that other stuff, it's all, that's, that's the curse. That's not, you know, going to bring a curse. That's the curse for decades and decades and decades of saying the only time we call upon God was when we needed him. Some of you are old enough to remember World War II. I'm not. But if you go to, to a place called Bedford, Virginia, there's a, uh, a D-Day memorial, and they have listed there the, the prayer that, that Franklin Roosevelt prayed before D-Day. He invoked the name of God. Franklin Roosevelt was not known as a godly, born-again anything, but he invoked the name of God. People invoke the name of God all through our history, and God has come through for us. But we're coming to a place right now where they're not, they're not calling on God anymore. They're not calling on God anymore. And what do we see happening around us? The curses of godlessness are taking control of our society. In Israel, in the Old Testament times, in ancient Israel, they were doing the same thing. And, and, and if, you, if, you, if you read anything about empires, you know, I was reading about the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire was at its height, when it was at its top, it's it like the, the, the second century. And everything looked so good on the outside. They had power, they had military, they, they were spread all over the, the Mediterranean uh, world at that time. They were up into Great Britain and into the Middle East and, and down into Africa. They had a great army, they had uh, leadership, they had wealth, but they also had great corruption in government. They had more slaves than free people in their society. That's who they depended on to do all the work. They had... This, they, they had turned everything backwards, and it was just another hundred years or so that their decline began to come, and the, and the uh, barbarians came from the north and so forth. But they looked good. Ancient Israel, when they were at their height, Jerusalem, Judah, when they were at their height, they looked good. They had a strong military. They had uh, a good economy. They had good, what looked like good leadership on the outside. Everything was going good. They had the, they had the temple, and they had the palace, and man, they had all kinds of stuff. But deep down inside, they were getting rotten. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, oh, man, he paints a sad picture. He said, my priests 
and my prophets are speaking false words to the people. They're telling them everything's okay. Everything's all right. Just, just it'll be all right. The enemy's at the door. They're surrounded the city. They're going to come and wipe us out. Everything, it's, it's going to be okay. Our economy, there's indications that our economy is, hey, man, the stock market's up. You know, I don't know. They say the stock market's doing so good. I don't, that hasn't trickled down to Main Street yet. I don't know, at least for me anyway. Oh, everything's going good. Everything's uh, in, in Jeremiah's time. You know, they was, and Jeremiah was standing up in the, in, the, in the public place and said, Repent, for our sins are catching up with us. And most of the people said, Don't bother me. And then when he started really doing it, they got mad at him. And they beat him up and they threw him in a sore. And they threw him in prison and they put him in chains and they tried to shut him up. But they can't, you can't shut up God's, God's people. And, and sure enough, just what Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, if you stop doing what you're doing, God will change his mind. But they didn't. You know, if America stops doing what we're doing, if we have a change, if we have an awakening, God will change his mind. But you know, if I'm not a gambling man, but if I was, I wouldn't put a whole lot on that. Judgment's coming. Wrath is coming. We're seeing the beginnings of it. We're, we're, we're beginning, you know, for those who are the remnant, who is standing up to, uh, you know, to believe that, 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 that what God says is true, we're getting to be in the minority now. We're, we're, we're getting to be looked upon as, uh, in, in this last couple weeks, four major denominations have crossed over the, the rainbow line. Four major denominations. Ours isn't one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If it was, I wouldn't be here. But, you know, give it enough time. Old Cleveland, Tennessee will <laughs> come out with it. It's hard for me to believe that would happen, but mm, you never know. Here's the thing, and here's what I want to leave with you this morning. I'm not going to keep you long. I don't want to give you a big old history lesson. But here's what I want to tell you. We need to be prepared, but we need not to be afraid. We need not to be discouraged because it's discouraging. But it's just happening the way God says it will happen. We, we need not be wringing our hands. We need not to be, and, and, and I, I believe in you know, voting. I believe in all that stuff. But you know what? The cure isn't in who you elect. I mean, I vote if you know, there's somebody worth voting for. But that's not where the cure is. That's not where the relief is. I want to read something for you this morning. And again, it's just going to be very, uh, really very brief, I think. In the book of Lamentations, which is right between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there's only five chapters. You know, when we hear the word lament, what does that mean? Sad, you know, lamenting, you know, re regretting what Donna was singing about. When you do something wrong and you, get, and you feel guilty about it, you lament and you say, oh, why did I ever do that? What was I thinking? Lamentations is a book of sorrow, of sadness that Jeremiah wrote. And he wrote it because when he saw the destruction of his people, he tried to warn them. He tried to say, stop, change, repent. And they just didn't listen. And if you read all through Lamentations, man, it's all kinds of horrible, sad, miserable stuff that was going on at the hand of God. He was talking about how God turned his back on his people. God told Jeremiah, stop praying for them. Wow. Wow. Some, let a preacher stand up and say, quit praying for the government. Quit praying for the president. Quit praying for the governor. Quit whoever. And I'm not just singling out one or people or one party. Or God told Jeremiah, quit, stop praying for him. Huh. Well, I hope God never says that about me. I hope God never tells somebody, stop praying for Pastor Carmen. Huh. Oh, no. 
stop praying for him. And if you read through the Lamentations, there's so much sadness and so much sorrow and so much just doom and gloom. Oh, man, it's coming. All this judgment's coming. But right in the middle of all that, in verse 21, Look at what Jeremiah says. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. This is what we need to stick in our minds this morning. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're not, it really doesn't matter. But if, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The only reason why the United States is still here is the mercy of God. The only reason why anybody is still here. You know, if you read through the Old Testament, there were times that God was getting ready to just completely change the program. When, when, when Moses was up on that mountain getting the Ten Commandments and the people were down there and they made that golden calf, man, God got his eraser out. And he was going to completely start all over again. Moses interceded for them. And God had mercy on them. In fact, if you read about the tabernacle, the main piece of furniture in the tabernacle was this, was this golden box called the ark. And on the top of the ark there was a lid, and it was called the mercy seat. Inside the box were the Ten Commandments. That's where we get the, we get the phrase, I think it's from Hebrews, it says, mercy covers judgment. We thank the Lord for God's mercy. Because if he's going to look at me with judgment, Pastor Karma ain't going to be here very long. You know, he, he, he had done that. Remember when uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, they tried to enter into that holy place with strange fire? Well, he, he sent some fire down, took care of them. Where the, the, the fella, uh, you know, his name was Achan, he took something from Jericho and God told him not to do it. He took care of him too. Ananias and Sapphira, well, don't go there, right? <laughs> I mean, if it's not for his mercies, you know, those were, those were times when God had to demonstrate his judgment. He had to demonstrate his will and he has done that. But I thank God for his mercy because he could have done that with me lots of times. After I got saved. After I started preaching. He could have done that with me lots of times. And you. He says, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because, thank God, his compassions don't fail. You know, there's sometimes I try to feel sorry for people and I just can't make myself do it. You don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's just sometimes, I mean, sometimes you have that natural compassion and you feel, but there's just some folks, man, I just can't force myself to feel sorry for them. I try, you know, I feel sorry for them. Sometimes my compassions fail. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes I'm just too tired to be compassionate. Sometimes I'm just too busy. Sometimes I'm just too distracted. Come, come, come on. But his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Every morning, he has new mercy for me. Not the old mercy, not what I needed yesterday, not the compassion I needed last, last week, but every morning I wake up, and God, it's, it's all new again. It's all new again. You know, some, I heard somebody teach one time on when God was creating things, and he spoke things into existence, and he said it was good. And they said, it wasn't like he spoke all the flowers into existence and said, it's good. He, he spoke like one flower at a time. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Every morning, when you open your eyes, God has a whole brand new box of mercy for you. For whatever you're going to deal with that day, for whatever you, whatever's going to come at you, for whatever the enemy, whatever fiery dart is going to come at you that day, there's a whole, it's not the same old mercy. It's not the same old grace. It's new every morning. Boy, when God makes it new, it's new. He has a lot of mercy. Here's 
His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. See, this is when we see the stuff going on around us today. Man, we need to say, Lord, great. There's a song we sing, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. He's a faithful God. Even when we're completely strung out, if he's our Savior, we might leave him, but he'll never leave you. We might turn our back on him, but he'll never turn his back on us. We might ignore him and let ourselves get distracted here and there, but he's faithful and just. He'll always be there. He says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that what? Wait for him to the soul that seeks him. If you're seeking after God, he's not going to. Jesus said, if you ask for, for, for a piece of bread, is he going to give you a stone? Is he going to give you a scorpion, a snake? It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Listen, this time we're living in, we need to plug this kind of stuff in our brain. Because you're not going to get any relief from the Supreme Court. You know, this, this last week they made some decisions that were pretty good decisions. They were, if you follow that. They made some good decisions. There's a couple more coming up. I don't know how good they're going to be. But you know what? Eventually, somebody's, somebody's going to mess with them. See? They're only men. They're only human beings. You're not going to get relief from there. You're not going to get relief from the Congress or from the Senate. Hopefully and prayerfully, some, some godly people get in there and, and make decisions. You know. But ultimately, all human government without God, and this is what our founding fathers said, all human government without God will always gravitate toward the evil without God. It's impossible to govern a nation without God. Now, I, I want to show you one more thing, and then we're going to close. Keeping that, that was like the Old Testament thing. Jeremiah, the children of Israel going through different, I, I didn't pull this scripture up but, uh, on the computer, but I'm sure they can find, over there in 2 Corinthians, I want you to turn there with me. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I believe. This is for us now in the New Testament. See, because Jeremiah was one guy that God chose to, to, to speak the word. Now you know who God has chosen to speak the word? Us. We're his testament. Look at chapter 4, starting at verse. Uh, well, let's just start at verse 1. We've got a little bit of time. The Apostle Paul writes this. It's okay if you can't get it. It's uh, Second Corinthians chapter four, and verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced. See if this fits you. We've re renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the, the minds. The, the, reason, the world is, is rejecting the word of God because their minds are blinded. They're blind. Look at verse 5. Just dropping down a little bit. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. I'm, I'm just reading down to where, where I want to get to. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. You have a light inside of you that God wants to shine. That God wants to shine to everybody. The only God anybody will see will be the light that's within the, the, the hearts of Christians. 
He says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God wants us to show people who Jesus is. You know, when, when Moses went up to the mountain, he was, he was like in the face of God. God wants Jesus to be in the face, in the face of everybody through us. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, here we go. This is where I wanted to get to. See, because this is where Paul was. This is where Jeremiah was. This is where we are, where we're getting. We're troubled on every side. Anybody feel that way? Personally. We're, not just, we're taking away the, the cultural thing right now. But just personally, do you feel like everything around you is falling apart sometimes? You don't just got like one thing going on over here, but you got this, and then this pops up, and something back here pops up, and somebody acts up, and it's like, what is going on? Not to mention that we're living in a wicked and perverse generation. He says, we're troubled on every side. Everywhere I look, I got trouble. But I'm not distressed. See? I'm not distressed. We're perplexed, scratching our heads, saying, what in the world is going on? Y'all know what I mean? But we're not in despair. Persecuted. We don't really, we really haven't sensed that, that much here yet, but it's coming. But we're not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Look, when these things start happening around us, we're saying, oh God, what are we going to do? He says, shine. Shine. God, what are we going to do? Oh God. I just read an article uh, recently over in China. They're destroying churches, knocking them down, taking the cross off the top of them. Those Christians over there are shining. They're shining. Okay. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in us, so that death works in us but life in you. And I'm closing. I'm just reading a little bit this morning. Drop, drop down a little bit. Look at verse 16. We're just going to close with this. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Why? Because his mercies are new every morning. When I die, his mercies, his compassion, just what we read in Jeremiah, they're new every morning. For our light affliction, <laughs> verse 17. Oh, see, now let me tell you something. When you're going through affliction and somebody comes up to you and says, well, you know, your light affliction, you want to smack them. <laughs> come on. But how many of you know who have been through it and have come out the valley of the shadow of death? You can look back and say, yeah, I remember when I was afflicted. But it was just for a moment. Just for a minute. This will pass. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, that light affliction, it's working for us. It's, it's, it, it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't look like it. And it sure doesn't feel like it. And you wish it could work some other way. But whatever you're dealing with, what, what the church in America is going to be dealing with, is just for a minute. But there's a purpose. That's 70 years of captivity that the Jews had to go through through Babylon. It had a purpose. He says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Same-sex marriage, abortion, this, those things will pass. They're temporal. We're not looking at the temporal. We're looking at the eternal. That's why 
when we wake up or we turn on the news or we pick up the paper and we read something that gets us so mad. We can say, great is your faithfulness, O God unto me. We can sing that song. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto. He's so faithful. His faithfulness is so great that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be concerned. But we need to be about our Father's business. He wants you to shine. He wants you to shine. And the darker it gets, the more you can shine. Amen. I'm going to ask George to come, and I'm going to sing that song one more time. Just the first verse, so beautiful for spacious skies. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm thankful. I thank God I live in America. I know all the black spots on our history. I know all the stuff that has come and gone, but I'm glad I'm an American. I'm glad that I have the freedom and liberty to stand up. I could stand on the street corner and preach a gospel, and they can't shut me up. They can try. But we have rights and liberties written down on a piece of paper called the Constitution of the United States of America. That even though they're trying to undo it, there are people who would love to just take an eraser and take a magic marker and cross stuff out and write other stuff in. They can't because the founders of our nation knew to have a nation with liberty and freedom. They, they crafted all that stuff in there. I thought they did probably about as good a job as anybody can do. It's a, it's, it's a human being. That's why we still have liberty. Because if it wasn't for that, they'd be tearing this building down too. They'd be telling you you couldn't, you couldn't go and worship God. They'd be telling you where to... So I'm thankful they can't do that yet. But I want to sing that song and ask, let this song be a prayer for a nation. If you, you listen, if you need prayer after church, please come on up. And I'm still a little raspy, so I'm kind of hesitant to kind of like lay hands on people. But if you need prayer for anything, you know, when, when we're done, I'm here and Brother George is here. And uh, we'll be happy to pray with you, Brother Leo. We'll be happy to pray with you. But for now, let's just pray for our nation. God has not told us to stop praying yet. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining. Father, that's our prayer this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this nation. We thank you, Lord, that you've had your hand on this. We thank you for the mercy that you've shown this nation over the years. Father, we need a whole lot more right now. Your mercies are new every morning, God, and we're standing on that word. And I pray you will help us as a remnant of believers, us and every other believer in this nation, stand for your word, Father. We're thankful that we're citizens of the United States of America, but more importantly, we're thankful that we're citizens of the kingdom of God. So, Father, I pray you would help us. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. You haven't told us to stop yet. So we're going to keep praying and believing for an awakening, a revival, a, a, a one last outpouring of your spirit. Father, we need it in this church. We need it in every church in this, in this valley, in this city. Pour your spirit out. Fill us with the Holy Ghost, oh God. Hallelujah. Empower us to be witnesses in the middle of a wicked and dark and perverted generation. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory. In Jesus' precious name. Let's sing that one more time. Oh, beautiful.